Awesome. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to get right into it this morning. Uh, The title of this message uh, this morning is called The Purpose of Spiritual Winter. And so if you have your Bibles there, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the scripture says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. If you write in your Bibles, I would underline that. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word this morning. We pray that it would be a good word sowed into the spirit of our heart, Lord God. I pray that you would lead us and guide us into all truth today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You read the scripture, and for me, I believe you could say this scripture fits today, society to a T. Without a doubt, we're living in some of the most challenging spiritual times uh, that we have known. And I know most generations could probably say that in their time as well. But there's a strong antichrist spirit in the world. There's a rejection of the word of God almost wholesale in most places, but in the world in general. Paul is writing to his son in faith, Timothy, and telling him, listen, even though people have itching ears and they want to hear a certain message because it's going to suit their own passions, you be ready in season and out of season. He's telling them, use your authority righteously. Preach the word of God without compromise. Stay in the battle, even if it means enduring affliction. As we enter into the winter months here in the Midwest, I want to share with you a spiritual parallel uh, to this, to the season that we're in. In the, in the midst of natural seasons, we need to be able to discern the spiritual seasons that we walk in. Every one of us here is going through a different season. In the winter, when you're not usually growing, be ready, be sharp, be instant, not lazy, as Paul is encouraging Timothy to be. He's telling him, be ready. Spiritual seasons parallel the natural seasons. However, they're not anachronistic. In other words, they don't go one after the other like the natural seasons do. We have the spring here. We have the summer. We have the fall. And we have the winter. Spiritual seasons can come in any different way. You could be in the middle of spring and all of a sudden go into winter. Or be in the middle of fall and go right into summer in the spiritual season. Let me give you the definitions for some of the seasons here. Spiritual spring is this newness, it's freshness, it's excitement, it's a growing time, and it's revival. Amen for spiritual spring, right? (laughs) Spiritual summer, it's abundance, it's maturity, it's freedom, it's harvest, it's fruitfulness, joy, dreams are being realized in a spiritual summer, amen? Spiritual fall, it's a season of transition, caution, a lack of growth, perhaps even loss of what you previously had. Spiritual fatigue begins to set in in spiritual fall. Anxiety, worry about the future, things are dying more than they're growing. Spiritual winter, which is where I'm gonna focus our message on today, difficulty. Pruning. Vision is being challenged or it's dying. Discouragement. Restriction. Severity. And maybe even spiritual death. Now I know as I come to preach this morning that spiritual winter doesn't invoke joy when I describe it like that. However, I want to give you a different lens with which to see a spiritual winter. Because spiritual winter has a purpose. Making the right decisions in any particular season, a spiritual season, causes the bad seasons to go quicker 
and the good seasons to last longer. Making poor decisions in these spiritual seasons make the bad seasons stay, and in fact, they can stay permanently, or we even forfeit God's purpose for our life in that season. Minimally, it'll delay the next season. It delays the spring. It delays the summer that we want to get to. And every spiritual season that you go through, God has a purpose, and he's looking for a right response. Amen? Amen. So today I want to share with you the positive purposes of spiritual winter. Now listen, the question is not, am I going to have a spiritual winter? The question is, how am I going to respond when I do have a spiritual winter? No one is exempt from these winters. God will send you and I a spiritual winter. Amen? Many people don't want to say amen to that, but it's, it's coming, I promise. Listen, there's a purpose, and there's a purpose in these spiritual winters. We just need to get the right response so that it comes and it goes. So here's the four positive purposes of a spiritual winter. Number one, it kills the bugs of the past and keeps them from affecting the future harvest. Now, I grew up uh, in the panhandle of Texas, and we grew up in a farming community. Uh, where I lived specifically was more of a cattle community, but we had a bunch of farmers around us, and um, they didn't like it when we had warm winters because warm winters meant wet winters. And there, if there wasn't a freeze, that meant there was bugs to fight all next year. And a pastor friend of mine, one time he went to a farmer during that warm winter, and he said, man, aren't you loving this warm weather? We're having nice weather. He goes, no, I hate it. It's terrible. We need a freeze. He goes, why do you need a freeze? He goes, because it kills the bugs. And he said, well, you have pesticides for that. They make pesticides for that. He goes, listen, a good hard freeze will do a whole lot more than the pesticides can do that. And, all, and, all, and on top of that, it'll save me a whole lot of money because I'm going to be fighting these things all year long. See, winter is like a biological firewall between growing seasons. Listen, fruit and bugs, they grow together. So after you harvest the fruit, before you plant again, you want the bugs dead because the fruit... And the bugs, they grow together. And so after you harvest, before you plant again, you want the bugs dead. Because fruit and bugs grow together. And so after you harvest, you get the point? You know where I'm going with this? We want the bugs dead. See, spiritual winter comes for the purpose of killing the bugs that can damage the harvest that God intends to send to you. Listen, a farmer can use insecticide all he wants to try and limit the damage that bugs can bring, but winter does it quicker and it does it cheaper. Winter goes down to the ground and kills the larvae, kills the bugs right in the ground. When you let God do what he wants to do in your life, it doesn't take long. God gets to the root issue and it's very effective. When you don't let God do what he wants to do, you try to fix it with your own methods it's going to drive you crazy, and in the end, it's not going to work. So what are the bugs? Well, let me just give you a few to start out with. Bugs are the things that are in us. They're the things that are around us that are sinful. They're unhealthy. They're immature. Or they're a compromise that could endanger the coming harvest. John 15, 1 says this. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Further down in verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. With God, winter is about fruitfulness. God desires that our lives bear the greatest fruit for him. And we see it as, as individuals walking around in life. We see it from a different perspective. But spiritual winter is God pruning our lives so that we can have a harvest come in the, in, in the summer and the spring. Now, I'm going to share this with you from my own personal experience. When you go through spiritual winter, the number one thing you go through is condemnation. 
you begin saying things like, why me? What have, I, what have I done wrong? I don't understand why this is happening to me. The second thing after that is anger. I've prayed every prayer, God. I've done everything that I know to do. Why isn't this working anymore? It works for everyone else. Why am I the exception? And that anger turns into anger towards God. But listen to me. God is in heaven right now looking down upon us in our spiritual winters and saying, I'm not trying to hurt you. I love you. There's a bug. Let me kill it. See, we make this so personal about ourselves. Everybody's got bugs. When spiritual winter comes, it's God's loving, pruning chastisement to take us into the new season of our lives by getting those bugs first. Winter sets us up for spring. It precedes newness and freshness. It, it, precedes, it precedes excitement and a growing time. Man, how many people want revival in their, in their season? How many people want vision and all those types of things that come with that? Maybe you've been through an awesome season in your life, and then that next season comes, the fall hits. I'm going to give you a heads up. When fall comes, it's God saying to you, listen to me. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm speaking to you, and you're not hearing me. He's trying to let you know you're getting ready to go into winter. When you go into the fall like that, you're tired. You're fatigued. Anxiety can set in, and, and you begin to worry about the future. Worse, you lay your sword down in the fall. And God says, don't lay your sword down. You're going to need that in the winter. You need to be quick, the Lord says. Be ready. Be instant, in season and out of season. Listen, there are no vacations from God. Would we agree with that? There's no vacations from the enemy either. We have to be ready. We have to be prepared. In my own life, I've been through a couple of spiritual winters where I felt as though I was going to freeze and die. <laughs> my struggle in those days was the fear of man. But I covered it up with pride. That was really smart, wasn't it? In one particular instance, I was on staff at a church, and after a particular service, I was actually, I preached, preached the message that Sunday, and as I got down, I'm feeling pretty good, because it was the service, I mean, the message was awesome, I mean, what do you expect, right? And so, it's funny, people laugh, it's okay. So, I come off the platform after preaching this awesome message, and a person walks right up to me, and they say, I don't like you. Wasn't that funny? <laughs> I don't like you, and I don't trust you. Whoa. But, you know, fear of man. I was like, whoa. But pride took over. Ah, it's okay. You'll get used to me. Then I walked into my office. I did what every good pastor would do. I just began to remind God of his biblical judgments. God, would you send her frogs? An unending number, Lord God. <laughs> Bring judgment on that lady. Yeah. Just being honest. See, throughout life you face things. Maybe not that. Maybe your battle is not fear of man or pride. But I covered it. I covered it up. And I wouldn't let God deal with the, the winter there. Another time when I was leading the church, Beth and I were leading the church, and, and the church leader came up, the church leaders came up to me and said, Eddie, we're not going the direction you're going. And I was like, oh, no, 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 it's good, good. I heard, listen, I've prayed, i fasted, I've heard God. This is what God says we're supposed to do. We're going this way. And the leader said, nope, Eddie, we're not going that way. I was devastated. 
I felt like a failure. I was asking God literally to let me die. I was frustrated. I was angry. I was mad at God. And I was saying, why did you bring me here? If this was what you're going to let happen. It's not something I'm proud of. But it was my winner. Newsflash. God didn't apologize. Can you believe that? And I waited a long time. Because you never know, maybe he's going to apologize. A couple of seasons later, I was going about my business and Holy Spirit brought a gentle correction into my life. And he said, referring to that past season, he said, I gave you ample time, Eddie, to lead those leaders in that church. Yet because of your fear of man, you allowed their mindsets to remain because you were weak. He didn't let me hold my head down for long. He said, be strong, not prideful. Move in my strength, and I will bless you. I realize that the fear of man causes more pain than the benefit of trying to please others can give you. Regardless of what what it cost me from there, I determined I'm not going to fear man anymore. I'm not going to use pride to cover it up. I'll fear God alone. Listen, the winners didn't go away from me until I said, God, kill that bug inside of me. No more condemnation, no more anger, no more fear, no more pride, pleading and bargaining. God, kill that bug. Listen, God wants to bear fruit through us, but he needs our permission. we're, We're not his robots, we're his disciples. And he desires fruit in us and through us, but he won't make us. Fruit and bugs grow together. And after you harvest the fruit, before you plant the next crop, you want the bugs dead. It's a real simple principle, but it can be painful to go through. Here's some other bugs that endanger the harvest. Spiritual laziness, prayerlessness, moral compromise, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, marriage and family problems, rebellion to authority. These are examples of bugs that need to die. And it's not about condemnation. It's not about guilt. It's about fruitfulness to the God. He wants to kill those bugs so that you can bear fruit. It's not just about us. It's about humbling ourselves, and it's about fruitfulness, as I said. It's, it's, it's about us in the sense that God loves us, and, and he's trying to do something in our lives, but it's his intent to kill the bugs. Say that with me. Kill the bugs. Number two, the purpose of spiritual winter is that it distinguishes the annuals from the perennials. Annuals are generally here for a short time, but perennials are here to stay. Annuals last for a season. Now, sometimes annuals are prettier, most times, but perennials are stronger. If you've ever seen a nicely structured garden, They structure the garden around the perennials, not the annuals, because they want the strong things that are going to last year after year to be the prominent thing, and then they surround it then with the, the, the annuals. In spiritual summer, it's hard to tell the difference between annuals and perennials, but when winter hits, you can tell real quick. People can be like annuals and perennials. We all have people around us that are, if we're honest, fair-weather people. For whatever reason, they don't have the character yet to stand with us in difficult times. When things are going great, yay, they're there, they're there. But the second things start going bad in your life, they seem to disappear. 
Anybody ever experienced that before? It's okay. We're not going to call anybody out, I promise. We love those people. It's not that we don't love them. It's not that they don't, it's not that they don't love us. But they're annuals. They're not perennials. We need those people around us. But we want the people around us that have been tested, that have been there through that spiritual winter with you. How many of you know a person that would stand with you through hell or high water? Come on, let me see your hands. I'm going to call you out on that one, see. We all have those friends. That's awesome. We need those people in our lives. But listen, we do need the others as well. First, First Chronicles 20, verse 1 says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, Joab led an army of, and ravaged the, the country of the Ammonites and came and besieged Rabbah. Now, there's an obvious reason in the scripture that they go out to battle in the spring because it's nicer weather. <laughs> the people that you surround yourself with, that inner circle, should be the ones that stood with you in the tough times. Those are the ones that you enjoy the springs and the sermon with. The biggest mistake you and I can make is to allow someone to get close to us just because it makes them happy. Because you'll find out when you need them to pick up a sword and fight with you in that spiritual winter, they've either laid theirs down or unfortunately they've turned it against you. When winter hits, you need the person next to you to pick up his sword alongside of you and get to work. I had a person tell me one time, <laughs> that's just hilarious. He walked up to me, we were in a service, and it was a ministry time, and he, he walks right up to me and he, and he says, I am supposed to be your armor bearer. And I think he was sincere. I, mean, I think he felt that he meant that. But I don't really fully think that he understood what an armor bearer meant. And so I said to him, you know that an armor, an armor bearer is the one that, only, that not only carries the armor for the king, but he also dies first. And he looked right at me and he goes, well, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> I was like, all right, buddy, I need prayer. <laughs> he wasn't my armor bearer. He wasn't an annual. I mean, he was an annual. He wasn't a perennial. He was there for a season. He loved me. I loved him, and he prayed for me. But if things got going tough, I knew he wasn't going to be there. In spiritual summer, when everything's happening, you see the growth, you see the excitement, you see the anointing of the Lord in that season. In spiritual winter, things are less apparent. The winter time reveals hearts. It reveals faith. Because the outer things that are apparent in the summer aren't apparent in the winter so much. People's faith is tested in spiritual winter. That's where you find out who will get in the trenches with you to fight. The other thing that winter does is it reveals loyalty. Because the future is in question. Even Jesus, when he was in his spiritual winter, he, and everybody was leaving him, he looked at the disciples and he says, are you going to leave me as well? And the disciples respond, Jesus, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Going back to angels and perennials, as you're walking through a garden, you come up to the hedge, and then you see that row of flowers, and your eyes naturally, for whatever reason, gravitate to those beautiful flowers. Listen, the hedge is steady. It's going to be there next year. The annual, probably not. So find out who your hedge is and take care of them. Amen? Amen. We need to appreciate all the people that God brings into our lives, especially those that are there in the good times and in the bad times. To use an awesome phrase, those are the steady eddies of the world. <laughs> we still need to be nice to the annuals that come into our lives. 
They may become a perennial. We don't know. But winter will tell. Distinguish the annuals in your life from the perennials. Number three, spiritual winter forces you to expand your wardrobe. If not, you're going to suffer harm. If you go into winter without the right clothes, you're going to suffer some harm. My spiritual winters, I just spend a lot of time whining and complaining. <laughs> Why me? Self-pity. Anger at God. I felt like I did everything right. God needed just to fix everything. Things you need to have in your wardrobe, praise and prayer. One of the garments that we've been given by the, by the Lord is a garment of praise. We put on praise. You have to put it on. We put on prayer. The garment of praise is a powerful weapon, and sometimes in spiritual winter, God is testing you to see where your focus is at. You see, when your focus is on God, praise happens automatically. It never stops. But when your focus is on you and your circumstances, praise is very temporary. When spiritual winter hits, and you don't have that garment on, Whining begins almost immediately. Prayer, another garment. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Say anything. <laughs> but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Listen, did you know that you can pray all day long and not be praying in faith? You can pray all day long and be ner more nervous when you get through. Jesus wants us to have a conversation with him. But just talking to God doesn't do any good if our faith is not activated in the midst of that conversation. You have to believe that he loves you. You have to believe that he is a good God and that he is a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. Activate your faith in the midst of prayer and that will begin to change your circumstances. When our attitude is right and our eyes are on him, our focus is on him, prayer is effective and it turns into praise. If not, prayer turns into spiritual whining. The other piece of the wardrobe is the armor of God. In spiritual winter, it's time to kill the bugs and you're going to have to fight to do so. Or you risk losing the intended harvest. There's a spiritual battle in front of you during your spiritual winters. Here's a promise. Luke 10, chapter 19, verse 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. You've been given authority by Jesus himself. He's given it to you, and you have to walk in it, or you're going to face loss. You have to use the authority that has been given to you. It's not in your strength. It's by his spirit. Amen? And what I mean by that, listen to me. If you're not advancing in the authority that God has given you to take what the enemy has stolen, if you're not advancing, understand there's no middle ground. You're losing. Does that make sense? There's no time out for the enemy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy so you have to continually advance and fight for the things that God has promised you. Amen. That was better than you guys responded, but I know two of you there, maybe. We're in, brother. <laughs> See, it's in the name of Jesus that we bind every evil spirit that comes against us. We have to stand, stand, fasten the belt of truth around us, Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. In every circumstance that we face, we take up the shield of faith because that extinguishes the fiery darts of the enemy, right? We put on the helmet of salvation. We take up the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. We pray in the spirit at all times. That is how we fight. When you allow the spiritual battle uh, to, 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 to come into your life and you fight against it, listen, that's how the bugs die. When the bugs die, there's no access point for the enemy in your life to get a hold of you. For me, it was pride. It was fear of man. 
That was terrorizing me. For you, it's something else. But whatever it is for you, bind that spirit, repent, give it to God, let him kill the bug that has bound you up, and fight. It may not happen overnight, but as you persist, as you pick up the word of God daily, as you declare God's promises over your life, yes, the enemy is going to challenge you. But when you walk in that authority, you stand in faith, abide in God's word, freedom will come. God's word, the sword of the spirit, it's a powerful weapon. And it's not for temporary use. We should use it so constantly that it becomes an extension of who we are. So find the armor, dust it off, sharpen the sword, and start putting it to use in your spiritual winters. Listen, man, as as followers of Jesus Christ, we're living in in, in a world that is lambs full of wolves. And whether you believe it or not, there are evil spirits that are bent on your destruction. This is something that we're not, we don't fear this stuff, but you can't be ignorant of the enemy's devices. You should have confidence in the weapons that God has given you to walk in the fullness of that authority, all of it. If he died for you to have it, use it. Amen? (laughs) Don't be like me, man. Instead of whining and complaining, put on that garment of praise. Pray heaven down. Put on the armor of God and walk in the fullness of the authority that God has given you. That'll take care of the problems that you face in your spiritual winter. Spiritual winters make you put on different clothing. Finally, number four. Spiritual winters make you appreciate summer. In the summertime, man, we, we, we learn to appreciate the goodness of God and what he's taken us through and and uh, how faithful he's been as we've been faithful to him. And when we do those things, we allow God to kill the bugs in us in spiritual winters. Listen, we go right into that summer and that spring and that summer. And as long as we stay obedient to that, then those summers remain. The next time fall comes, you, you sense a, a fatigue, a tiredness, a laziness, kind of a dullness coming. Whoa, 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 whoa. God, I feel winter's coming. And you just raise your hands and God, where are the bugs? Kill them. Kill them quick. Whatever that is, kill it. I don't want to be in winter long. And you allow God to go in there. And he's like a surgeon, man. He begins to kill those bugs one at a time. And before you know it, you're in spring again. And you're getting ready for summer. What we used to take for granted, we no longer take for granted when we hit spring and summertime. Spiritual winners will beat the unthankfulness out of you if you let it. And when it's over, when it's over, you're thankful for what God has taken you through. You're thankful for that spiritual winner because allow God to reveal in you the things that were going to destroy your harvest. And as you surrender to him, you enter into the newness that God has for you. Some of you here this morning are right in the middle of a spiritual winter. Making the right decisions in this season will cause the season to go way quicker. And the good season is coming to last a whole lot longer. But making a poor decision right now will make the season stay, the spiritual winter. Don't do that. Allow God to kill the bugs so that you're able to enter that newness, the freshness, the excitement of spring, that growing time revival. Allow him to walk you into that abundance, that maturity and the freedom, the harvest and the fruitfulness so you can see your dreams realized and experience the joy that God intends for you to to receive that spiritual summer. Stand up with me if you would. I was preparing this message a couple weeks ago. Somebody sent this to me, and it's a prophetic word, and I held on to it until today. And um, she 
quotes a, a few words of a song. I'm not going to sing it because that will hurt everybody. But let me just read this to you. The song says, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him and in his presence daily live. The writer goes on to say, I don't know who this is for, but God is saying, trust me with your surrender. That marriage problem, that money problem, that health issue, maybe it's an issue with the child. Give those problems to me. I will be faithful to lead you through the troubled water. I will see my child I entrusted with you through the child, through the trials. Come to your daddy God. I've got this. If you're here this morning and you're in a spiritual winter, maybe some of the battles are what I just described there. Marriage problems, financial problems, problem with a child or a loved one. Something that God is trying to do in you that you're struggling. He wants to kill the bugs, and his, his, his intent is not to cause you any harm. He has a plan to give you a hope and a future and to release you into an abundant harvest. But he can't do that until he does this first. If you're here this morning and you're going through a spiritual window, would you just raise your hands with me? I want to know who I'm praying for today. It's okay. There's, remember, no condemnation. We don't have time for that. we got to be honest with God. Come on now. Amen. Father God, you see these hands lifted up to you this morning, Lord God. All of us that have our hands lifted up that have gone through spiritual winters are going through them right now, Lord God. We ask you to come right now like a dread champion, Lord God, and kill those bugs. Father, we as an act of our will surrender to your will, Lord God. Show us the areas of our lives that we need to surrender to you, that you might eradicate all the things that are keeping us from a harvest, Lord God. For the sin in our lives, Lord God, we repent. and We call on you, Lord God. Forgive us of our sin, Lord God. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord God, and begin a healing work in this wintertime, Lord God. Shorten this season for us, Lord God, that we might begin to prepare for spring and newness of life. If you raise your hands this morning, I prophesy new life over you this morning. Newness of life, the fullness of joy, that the joy of the Lord will be your strength in the coming season as you surrender and allow God to kill those bugs. Now listen, if you're not in a winter today, you have, you have weapons, you have tools now to, to understand when it happens. When God begins to speak to your heart and to warn you about the bugs, give it over quickly. Give it over quickly and say, God, I see the bugs, kill them. Because I want to walk in spring and summer. There may be one or two of you here this morning that you're living life in a spiritual winter because you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you today that there's another way. Jesus himself says that he's the way, he's the truth, and he's life. And if you will surrender your life to him, I promise you, you'll start a new season today. So before we finish here, is anybody here that needs to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you are, just raise your hand and wave at me. I want to pray for you. Anybody here? Awesome. I see you, girl. Thank you. I see you, buddy. Right there. Awesome. Anybody else as I look around? Fantastic. We're gonna, everybody's going to pray this together. I want everybody to pray this with me. And if you raised your hand, I want you to pray this with me as well, okay? Listen, you're doing business with God. This isn't about us praying. We want to join with you and partner with you in prayer, but this is about you and God having a private moment. Everybody repeat after me. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I admit my need for a Savior. I repent of my sin, and I surrender my life to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me, guide me into all truth. I receive your salvation, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a clap offer for that, would you? Listen, we serve a good, good God.
He is a good God, and He wants to prosper you and bring you into harvest season. Let Him get to those bugs, all right? Let Him get to those bugs, and I promise you, there's going to be great things ahead. God bless you guys. We're going to go into the song again, and then Beth will come up and close for us.